It is the 31st of December, 2009. We are at the home of Mr. William W. Wright of Cocoa Beach, Florida, born on April 12, 1918 in Hartford, Alabama. Mr. Wright served in the United States Navy prior to and during World War II as Chief Petty Officer. Mr. Wright also served in the Korean War as well as in NASA. He ended his career as a Chief Petty Officer and as the first Chief Guided Missileman in the Navy. Conducting uh, the my interview, military career. In your now. military career. Yeah. Conducting the interview is Christopher Bryans, teacher at Community Christian School, along with Mrs. Olney Wright and Mr. Eric Wright. Well, Mr. Wright, I understand you grew up in, in Alabama. Tell us about your, your growing up years prior to joining the Navy. It was just routine South Alabama. That was back during the 30s when they had segregation and all that that they did away with later. And uh, I went to Sampson High School and graduated from that, and then I enlisted in the Navy. And then I did 20 years service in the Navy. And then when I retired from the military, I went to work for NASA. When did you enlist in the Navy? 1956. No. Or, or, or originally, 30, when you enlisted 36. in 1936. In 1936. Yeah. Why did you choose the Navy? Well, it was a preferred service back then. It was a little <laughs> more charisma to it, I guess. But anyway, I just always wanted the Navy. Was this right after high school? Yeah, right out of high school. In fact, I went on the waiting list for, they had a waiting list back then. It was in such demand. And then I was all set to go, and then they had a polio epidemic in Alabama. So they froze the state. And so I had to wait about six or eight months until they called me up in November of 19... 36. 36. I get the years big. Now that would have been right um, about the time that President Roosevelt was elected for his second second uh, term. And I understand that uh, you had, had some special event in oh, connection with his second Yeah, inaugural. when they, uh, I was at Norfolk. And so when they inaugurated Roosevelt, they sent a squadron of us up to march in the parade, sent us on a ship from Norfolk up to Washington. And I participated in that parade. It was sleeting and raining the entire time. It was the most horrible day you ever saw in your life. And we had to march 20 miles all the way from, oh, about 9th Street south, well, way down the boulevard, Constitution Avenue, and then we marched all the way up to the White House, and then we went back aboard the ship and came back to Norfolk. And so that was um, during your uh, during your. Boot I was camp. in boot camp. You were in boot camp at the time. In, in Norfolk, yeah. Well, tell us about what you remember about boot camp, any incidents that you remember um, about what it was like and what you had to go through. Oh, <laughs> it was just routine military boot camp. They teach you hygiene and marching and, oh. But you made a lifelong friend. Did oh. you make any significant friends while you were in Oh, boot yeah. Camp? We, we made a, one friend that, well, I went through boot camp with him, and then we went to trade school together and for years we kept pretty close we kind of lost contact recently but i still hear from him once in a while yeah so you've kept in touch since 1936 with that one with that one, one individual yeah so where uh did you go following your boot camp in norfolk let's see That would have been your training um, well, for your... Well, uh, after boot camp, after boot camp I, yes. they sent me to the West Coast, and that's when I went on the vessel, the so repair did you, ship. 
the repair ship, and uh, what was your what was your position at that time? Well, I would just uh, see my uh, fire. Well, if you, if you were in what they call the black gang down below deck, you were fireman. If you were topside, you were a deck eight. They could call you a, a seaman. And of course, I was a had already I was, went to electrician school. So I was, had uh, I was a fireman then, and then I went up. Was this a the, Navy electrician school? Yeah. Oh did yeah. You, did you have the opportunity to choose the field um, that you wanted to go in? Did oh you yeah, you you had to take exam to get in it, and just a few were selected, and uh, I knew I wanted to be an electrician if I could get that. Did you have any electrician background no, before you went into the Navy? No, no, uh -uh. <laughs> But you decided that's what you wanted to do? Yeah. I had a first cousin who went in the Navy six months ahead of me, and he was keeping me prepped on all these things that happened to him and passed it along to me, and that's how I think I was able to get in these schools that I wanted to. Were there any uh, humorous or unusual incidents that you can think of from either your time in boot camp or your time in training before you reported aboard the Vestal? <laughs> no, it was just drudgery. <laughs> oh, for I think for, for a month or six weeks, we weren't even allowed to go ashore to go home. Uh, Liberty, off base. And then after that, they did let us, if, if we wanted to go over to Norfolk or go ashore, we could do it. Did you find Virginia a lot different from, from your small town and Oh, and yeah. Well, Norfolk, pretty good-sized city. And uh, then I was quite different from South Alabama. How was it different? Well, it was just a city. To me, it was a large city, and it's still a pretty good-sized city. And uh, so, uh, so you reported aboard the Vestal. When I left, uh, left? When, when no, when I left boot camp, I went to trade school. Mm -hmm. It was four months, I believe. Was that on the West Coast? That was in Norfolk. In, oh, that was still I, in Norfolk. I'd say Norfolk for About that. About four months? For the trade school. And then when we finished that, they sent us to the West Coast by train. And then I went aboard the Vesta, which was stationed in San Pedro at that time. The Pacific Fleet then was on the West Coast, not in Hollywood. Not in Hawaii. They didn't send the fleet to Hawaii until well, 1940, when the Japs were beginning to be a real threat, and we knew we were going to have war with them. So they transferred the fleet from the West Coast, mainly in San Pedro, to uh, to Hawaii, and then it stayed there until Pearl Harbor, of course. Do you remember how much money you made at the time as a, uh, what was it, a fireman, when, apprentice, fireman recruit? When I went in the Navy, you made everybody made $21 a month. And uh, we got a little bonus payment of a dollar or two. I forget what that was for. But uh, then I made <coughs> fireman. When you made fireman, your pay went up from $21 to $30. Thirty dollars a month, and uh, then I went on a petty officer. I think made sixty dollars a month. I believe. Yeah. Did you make firemen um, it before Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what did you do Fire with all of that money? Being Thirty dollars a month. You made <laughs> fireman was was automatic. I have to see if you didn't foul up some way, and oh, you could have a good liberty on five dollars. You didn't need a lot of money back then. The thing was cheap. So before you went out to to Hawaii, uh, yeah. What what kinds of things did you do for liberty before you uh, reported aboard the vessel? 
what little liberty they gave you at the time. <laughs> Oh, of course, they had a lot of facilities on the base, a library and different things. And then the, they had an old trolley that ran from the naval base at San Pedro in Norfolk. And uh, Rusty shaking her head. That San one? Diego. And, San no, it, it was San Pedro. San Pedro. And uh, <clears throat> then when... Uh, so you'd go to town? Oh, yeah, catch a streetcar into town, or several of us would pool our resources and hire a cab, and well, just the routine things you do on Liberty. Some of them go to beer joints, of course, and different things. <laughs> so you reported aboard the Vestal. Now, this would have been in early 1940. Probably a little sooner than about thirty nine. Probably it's ah, a, okay. it's on my certificate. Yes, Rusty, you were looking at it the other day, but I'm not sure it told when I went aboard or anything. So you went. So your your progress was from from uh, Norfolk, and then you were four months in uh, in in trade, trade school, school, and then you went aboard the vessel. Then I went aboard the vessel in San Pedro. That would have been around 1937 then. Something like that. Well, you yeah. went in in 1936. Yeah, yeah right. Uh huh. So you reported aboard the Vestal, and uh, tell us tell us about life aboard ship as as a fireman. What were your duties? Well, I was an what they call an electrician striker. If you'd been to a trade school, then you went aboard ship, and you were called a striker. If you went to gunnery school, you were a, a gunnery striker, electrician, you were an electrician striker. And then when you got to be a petty officer, then you weren't a striker anymore. You were a petty officer. And then the regular routine promotion back to that. So was there a routine um, in, in port for you that that was different from, say, a routine when you went out on maneuvers with the fleet? In other words, what did you do? Well, when you were with the fleet, of course, you were at sea. You couldn't do anything except your job on the ship. Tell us about your job aboard the ship, some of the specific well, things you would do. I finished uh, trade school before I went aboard ship. Right. And so then I was uh, what they call an uh, electrician striker. I worked with the electrical group, but I was, well, they call it an apprentice today. And uh, What did that involve? Just everything electrical, taking care of motors, generators, lighting on the ship, navigational lights, anything that was electric, you were concerned with it. So what? Uh, so was the most of the Vestal's work, since it was a repair ship for the fleet, was most of its work done in port? Yes, yes it was. It was all done in port because we, uh, the ships that we repaired, they were cruisers and battleships. We didn't repair anything smaller than that. Now, the... Uh, the smaller ships were called tenders that took care of destroyers, and uh, it only repaired destroyers. But we retired, we repaired cruisers and battleships, and we always went alongside them for the period of repair. We usually go alongside a cruiser or a battleship for about three weeks. And they'd have all these things in waiting that they didn't have the personnel or the equipment to take care of. And so then that's what we would do because they didn't have the trained personnel in that specialty. And they also didn't have the equipment. To, well, they couldn't, have, they didn't have the space on a, a fighting ship. So we took care of all that when we go alongside. So, 
While you were at San Pedro, uh, yeah. the fleet would go out for maneuvers for, for we, a period of time. We about... usually go out on Monday and come back in on Friday afternoon. Unless there was some special maneuver they wanted to hold, and then we might stay out over the weekend, a couple of weeks. But usually, we were uh, we'd go we'd uh, go out on Monday and come in on Friday. And I was in the the base force. That was uh, sh the force that comprised. Uh, Repair ship vessel for the cruise and battleships. The Medusa was the repair ship for the destroyers. And then they had tenders uh, that r repaired the submarines. All, all different categories because it required different kind of spare parts and equipment and training for the personnel, all that. So, uh, as we were saying, you reported aboard the Vestal in, uh, in 1937. That sounds right. Yes, to, to be exact, in, uh, in September 1937 uh, through 1939. And uh, then you went aboard the USS Relief oh, for a that, period of time. I had an appendectomy. And they sent you to a hospital ship then, not to a... A, a naval hospital. If you were, if there was a hospital ship there, and the uh, relief was there in San Pedro, so they sent me over to, to it for my appendectomy. And you were there about a month. Yeah. Back then, reference. if you had an appendectomy, you uh, see how it worked. Uh, you couldn't, you couldn't get up for a solid month. Yeah, and uh, I think you could walk after 24 hours, but not before that. If you had a hernia operation, they wouldn't let you walk for a month, which was the worst possible thing they could have done. But uh, my appendectomy, I only had, uh, I believe I had uh, kept me in bed for for a day or two, wouldn't let me even stand up. And then uh, I don't remember how long the recuperation period was, but it wasn't too long, a couple of weeks. And then they sent me back to the vessel. And then uh, it, it's uh, a while later, apparently in July of, uh, excuse me, August of 1940, you reported to the Naval Research Laboratory in, uh, in Bellevue, in, in, in Washington, D.C. In Bellevue. DC. I went to school for six months. What was the uh, occasion? What kind of school was it? It was a special communication school. They were just coming in with automatic telephones back then for shipboard use. So they had to send all of us so we could be equipped to take care of them if something happened to them. And, uh, was this your first visit to the nation's capital? Oh, no. Uh, when after I, the inaugural? No. When, uh, after I finished high school, they f froze Alabama because of a polio epidemic. Mm -hmm. And so I had to wait for six months before the Navy called me. So I had a brother in Washington. And so I hitchhiked to Washington and got a job as a curb hop. At an A and W root beer place, same old moral that runs A and A and W now, and uh, made good money. Man, I made it. My brother was working as a soda jerk and going to law school, and I was making more money hopping the curb than he was as a soda jerk. <laughs> but <laughs> this was all while you were waiting to come into the come into the navy. Come into the navy. So after the school, apparently you were promoted to EM one EM first class. What? EM EM one C. Up through well, first uh, EM three, then EM two, EM one. They promoted all of us to first class 
when we finished that school in Washington. And then you Most of us were second class then. And then you reported aboard the Vestal again in uh, March of um, March of 1941. Yeah, after I finished the school, I went back aboard the Vestal. And you were there on that on that December 7th. But before I get into Pearl Harbor, yeah. tell us about your tell us about your impressions of the Hawaiian Islands being a uh, you know, boy from Alabama coming out there to the middle of the Pacific. <laughs> Well, it was real novel and enjoyable for a while, but then they were beginning to have a Jap scare, so they started tightening up. They had a curfew. You couldn't stay ashore overnight, and then it got to where people didn't like it. Even the married people have had a curfew, so they'd have to be back aboard ship. By six o'clock, I believe it was, and uh, then when they had the real Jap scare, they sent the West Coast Fleet, which was in San Pedro mainly, to Hawaii to be based there, and that's where it was, of course, when the Japs hit it, bombed us. Tell us about what you what you recall the day before the attack or, or, or two days before the attack? Well, it was just routine then, working aboard ship, keeping up, doing the job on the ship. We were tied to the battleship Arizona, so we would, they'd send parties of us over to do jobs that they weren't able to do, like, oh, maybe installing some new equipment or running cable or Various jobs that the these battleships, these crews and battleships just didn't have the equipment to to do, and didn't have the personnel to do it either. So we would do that kind of work for them. And then came that Sunday morning. Right. Well, that uh, <coughs> let's see, we were. I believe we were still under, were already under a curfew, if I'm not mistaken. So everybody had to be back aboard, except I think maybe the married people could stay ashore. But if you were single, I think you had to come back aboard ship, maybe at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. But, uh, and uh, the ship was just tied up at, we call it Ford Island. This is this island in the middle of Pearl Harbor. And Eric and Susan have been there, but uh, they had these berths, these cement berths that the battleships all and cruisers tied up at. And we we tied, we had a special one of them too. When Eric was out there, they had one of them that would mark the vessel. But of course, before the attack, they moved us from where we were tied up at that that anchorage, uh, that big cement dock. They moved us over alongside the Arizona. And of course, that's where we was when they bombed us. When those first bombs hit, where were you? Well, I was an electrician back then. And uh, every Sunday morning, before we would go up to breakfast, we'd go up to the shops that we were worked with, either electrician or fire control or gunner or whatever you did. You always had a shop you worked out of. And so that Sunday morning, all of the electricians <coughs> were up in the electrical shop. And that's... Uh, that's where we were when the when the attack came. So what were your first impressions? <laughs> that was kind of funny because when the first impression was the ship shook and we knew that something bad had happened to shake the whole ship. And so 
one of the guys in the electrical shop said, oh, that's that, uh, we had a whole bunch of spare part lockers down below deck, down below the shop, and had all these spare parts in metal boxes on shelves. And this one guy said, oh, one of those spare part boxes fell off the shelf. And I said, no, that wasn't that. I said, that damn circulating pump blown up. We've been having trouble with a pump. And so then, uh, after the second shaking, somebody, well, the, they sounded general quarters, which is battle stations. So, of course, then we, and then somebody yelled out, the Japs are attacking us, so... Uh, but uh, but that was the first impression of the the two shakings of the ship. The first time, the guy thought it was a spare part box fell off shelf down below, below the shop, and uh, then the other thought that that a pump had blown up. And then the alarm for general quarters sounded. Sounded. Too. But not till after that. And then what did you do? Well, we went to general quarters. And uh, I was an electrician back then, communication, so I had built a fire control switchboard up in the wardroom, and it, I had it, had it connected to the gun, gun mount up on the foredeck, and then uh, back on the stern. We had two three-inch dual-purpose anti-aircraft guns. That's all the armament we had, no torpedoes, anything like that. So my general quarter station was that fire control switchboard that I had made and installed over the over the months. So I was up at it, and then uh, when they said the Japs are attacking and we knew we were being bombed, and all my communication went out. I, I couldn't communicate with the forward gun or the the gun back on the stern. So finally, I just left the wardroom and went up topside to see what was going on. Well, we knew that by then that the Japs were attacking us. And uh, I remember the we our executive officer was uh, pretty old. And I remember when I got up to the wardroom, he was running through the wardroom yelling, abandon ship. <laughs> That was about the time that the captain was blown off the bridge when the Arizona blew up. So the captain swam back to the gangway, to the to the ladder, and he clambered up on it and went, got back on the bridge. And then by then we had steam up, and so he ordered, uh, had to cut the boatswain mate took axes and cut loose from the Arizona, had these big hemp hawsers that had us tied to the Arizona, and they cut those lines, and they had steam up by then, so the captain ordered the ship to get underway, and we ran aground over it. The edge of Pearl Harbor is just a big mud flat once you get a, away from where the ship's the berth and where the channel going in and out is so we ran up we were sinking by then we'd been hit by two bombs and uh, <laughs> it was odd one of the bombs they were both 16 16 inch Jap naval shells that they fashioned fins on and dropped them from high altitude the one that hit us <laughs> would, would you care to show us that uh, that that one that you have there? Yeah. Um, that. This. Uh, tell us tell us a little bit about that. This is a fragment. There we go. The uh, the two bombs that hit my ship. The first one. The fuse didn't work. So it didn't detonate, it didn't explode. So it went through the main deck and through six other decks and knocked a 20-foot hole in the bottom of the ship. 
15, 20 feet, enough that it was sinking us. And uh, and uh, the other bomb that hit us didn't didn't uh, did detonate, but fortunately, just forward of where my battle station and workstation was, the electrical shop, they had a a hole that had a whole bunch of uh, spare boiler tubes and cable for rewiring generators and motors and all that sort of thing. And the other bomb exploded in the midst of all that. So really it didn't do any structural damage to the ship. But the one that didn't detonate and knock the hole in the in the bottom of the ship, then it was sinking us because that that hole was flooding and uh that you had mentioned that the order was given to abandon ship. Yeah, when I got up to the ward room after general quarters were sound in the executive officer, he might have denied it later, but he he told everybody to abandon ship. But why didn't they? Why didn't people well, abandon ship? <laughs> because you, I went up topside and looked out on the water, and it was just nothing but a fiery flame because the, all the oil had already been spilled out of the battleships that had been torpedoed, and it caught, it was on fire. So if everybody would look over the side, you weren't going to jump out and flame in oil. So the guy just stayed on the ship. And our captain, who was on the bridge, his name was Young, Casson Young, and it was blown over the side. He swam back to the gangway and got back aboard ship. And by then, we had steam up. So we were able to get underway, and we ran the ship aground over it. They call it Aiea Landing, which is just a bunch of old mud flats out at the edge of Pearl Harbor. Now I want to back up um, yeah. to, this, to this moment there at ten minutes after, five minutes after 8 or yeah. so. When the Arizona received that bomb that blew it, blew in it two. up, tell us where you were and and and, and what happened to you at, at at that moment in time. You were topside at that moment, or were you still down uh, down below? Well, I, after after the second bomb hit, I was at my battle station, which was at the fire control switchboard in the ward room, and then when all communication on the ship was knocked out, and I couldn't get anybody. I finally just went up topside to see what was going on. But the Arizona had not been hit yet. Oh, with yeah. That, with that bomb. It had already been it hit? It had already been hit. It... Because there's footage that shows half of the ship as a giant sheet of flame when that when that bomb hit. Uh, a film it hit the Arizona? It wouldn't hit the Arizona. And you were you were below deck at that at that moment. Well, when Arizona was first bombed, both times I was down below deck at my battle station. When it blew up. When it blew when up. When it. When it blew when up, it, and when the, the the explosion that knocked the commander, uh, the captain, into the water. Where were you the at water. that moment? I was at my. By then, I was at my battle. No, that was before I went to my battle station because general quarters hadn't even been sounded. So, uh, but he, we probably had general quarters, though, because he probably, the captain probably wouldn't have been on the bridge otherwise on Sunday morning. So, uh. You don't, re do you recall hearing that massive explosion that, 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 that blew the Arizona in two? Was oh, it, yeah. Kind of we, when it, when it blew up, a lot of the guys that were topside were blown over the side into the water, so we were busy trying to rescue all of them that we could, that could make it to our ship, and we were, had cut ourselves loose from the Arizona. Yeah, where were you, though, exactly when the Arizona, when they hit the magazine of the Arizona and it blew up? Do you remember that? Oh, I probably hadn't even got to my battle station. I was probably drinking coffee in the electrical shop. 
So that happened very early on. Oh, that was before they even signed the general quarters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, and after the the Japanese, after the second wave had left and mm -hmm. had gone back to the, the carriers, carriers uh, what then did did uh, did the crew do? You had been taken the Bastille, you had beached it at Iao Point, well, and then what? Well, mainly it was keeping it, uh, just keeping the ship going. It was resting on on the bottom, but it was shallow enough that it didn't go under. So we just stayed on the ship and kept it running. We were able to run the generator and had lights on the ship and all that. And uh, then we, uh, the Navy Yard almost immediately started fabricating a patch. We called it a caisson that that fit over the hole that the uh, the bomb that went out the bottom knocked in the bottom of the ship. And this patch, they put it on a tug and took it out to us, and then they put lines on it and dropped it down to the side of the ship, and then they worked it around so that the the patch they had made fit over the hole, and then they right away they started pumping out that hole, and when they got it pumped out, the ship was was back on the surface again, and so then then we moved the ship over to the navy yard. How long did that take to do all of that? Oh. Three weeks, I think, from the time the attack came until uh, we got over the Navy Yard and were in dry dock. They put us in dry dock as soon as we got to the Navy Yard. Were you all expecting um, another attack or an invasion? Yeah, I remember I was up up in the ward room at my battle station, and uh, the radio man reported to the captain, I heard him tell him that uh, that a mass Japanese Air Force 90 miles off Barber's Point, that's over on the other side of the island of Hilo, and 90 miles out at sea, they said there was another mass attack, but that was a false report. It, uh, it didn't show. Dad, you had mentioned once that um, a lot of the American pilots didn't think that the Japanese pilots, you know, were capable oh, of uh, actually. I, I remember one time the ship was in, I think in Maui. I think it was in Maui. And a whole bunch of us were over drinking beer. That's all there was to do there. Was this before the attack? Yeah, before the attack. And I remember there's a table of naval aviators Avi aviators next to the table I was at with the other sailors. And I remember them saying that, well, Japs would never be a formidable foe because they had a an inner ear defect. So they <laughs> couldn't be such good pilots. Well, boy, I, I saw every battleship that they bombed after it got into the Navy Yard and in dry dock. And you could have taken a, a 12 inch rule and there was about that much difference in the different holes in the different ships. They were really precision torpedoes that they launched at the, and the two bombs that hit us, one of them hit right in the middle of the forward end of the ship and the other one hit right in the middle of the after end of the ship, and I don't. It it wasn't a foot off the center line of the ship. There you go. So the vessel remained at, at Pearl Harbor, um, and you remained on the vessel at Pearl Harbor until the middle of 1942. Yeah, until I went back for new construction. So uh, during that entire time on the vessel, uh, since the vessel had been refloated, were you working on repairing? Those ships and yeah, I'm repairing the vessel, 
just routine work once they, once we got it afloat. And uh, once we got the float, the tug pushed us back out to the anchorage there in the middle of Ford Island. And so we stayed there. And uh, you worked on the ships that were, were, the, were your primary concern? Well, the repairing the, the one that had ones. been damaged. Now, of course, all the battleships had been sunk. So uh wasn't much repair you could do on them. I know right next to us, the uh, Oklahoma, I believe Oklahoma was one ship over, and it had just rolled belly up. And, you know, an odd thing happened. Some guys were in a boat going over that hull, and they heard some pounding down inside that ship. So they rushed some uh, acetylene torches, some cutting tools from the Navy Yard out to it and cut a hole in the bottom of that Oklahoma and got several survivors out mm -hmm. that were trapped inside the Oklahoma. These were uh, your fellow crew members from the Vestal? Well, no, the, these the were Navy Yard the Navy workers. Yard personnel. Did all the rescue, yeah. The, not the guys on the ship. They were just keeping the ship operating. Uh, Dad, how many ships did they refloat and put back into action that were actually sunk or partially sunk? Do you recall? Every, every single one of them except, uh, except the Arizona. And the Oklahoma? Yeah, the Oklahoma. Well, they, no, it's they righted it and refloated it, salvaged it. it. And it sank being towed back to the West Coast. Yeah. It, uh... It was kind of stupid to have done it. It was more for morale purposes, I think, than anything else. Because even once, even after they got them refurbished, they were still old World War Two, sixteen-inch battleships, and their day was done. The day the carriers started operating out in the Pacific. So after, in the middle of 1942, then you reported back uh, to San Francisco for about a month. That was for new construction. What was, uh, what was involved with that? Well, when you, new construction was desirable duty if you were in Pearl because that's the only way you could get back. If your enlistment was up, they say, okay, we'll give you an enlistment a discharge but when you get to the bottom of the gangway, the army is going to be there to draft you. <laughs> so they they had some formidable tools that they could force a guy to to stay in the navy. So right you were away. convinced to reenlist. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't about to go back and wind up as a doughboy or a GI. <laughs> Tell us about this new construction that you were involved in in San Francisco. Oh, I I put two or three ships in construction. When a, a new ship was being built, after they got the, well, they started the hull, they would assign a nucleus crew, usually in different specialties. And so if you were assigned to one, you went there and you, you lived in barracks next to it there in the Navy yard or the shipyard if it was a civilian yard and then you stayed in these barracks until the ship was habitable and then you went aboard ship and stayed on it then and as long as you were on it. And this, uh, what was the name of that ship that you were aboard? Oh, the troop ship. That was that a troop ship that that you were that you actually was uh, assigned to after uh, San Francisco. In other in other words, I um, I, I understand that you were aboard a, a sh uh, very shortly a ship called the USS Neches Neches Neches. That Neches. was my new construction. That was a fleet tanker. And the difference between a fleet tanker and just an ordinary tanker. The fleet tanker traveled with a task force. They could do about 25 or 30 knots, and they could keep up with the task force. And, oh, we would refuel crews and battleships underway all the time. They were, the crews on the 
tanker were experts at the way they could throw well. They'd throw a line over with a lead ball on the end of it, and then they'd pull a hawser over, and then they'd pull the the ropes over to tie the ship together, and then they'd pull the fuel line over, and then we could we could fuel them at sea. They could be out operating on maneuvers, and we'd operate right with them. If they were. Well, what was your duty following um, that that ship, the USS Nishes? Where did you report after that? Oh, let's see. Would that have been the motor torpedo boat, that uh, boat was flotilla? The motor torpedo boat flotilla on Guadalcanal. And uh, really the big repair shop for the motor torpedo boat was on Tulagi, which is over across the harbor. It had a real deep harbor and plenty of room. And uh, so instead of being based on Guadalcanal, which didn't have a good harbor, they had to have ship lying offshore and they didn't have a dock or anything at uh, Guadalcanal. So uh, when I was assigned to the to the motor torpedo boat flotilla, since I wasn't I wasn't in the crew, I was at the repair base and that was on Tulagi, which is across the bay from uh, Guadalcanal. And so I was there for, well, until I went back to the state for new construction, I guess. Dad, one of your, one of your cousins was out there with you in, uh, in Hawaii, and he became a naval aviator, correct? That, he was, was it the same cousin that, that went in before you six months yeah, ahead of Yeah, he you? went in six months ahead of me, and he's... Boy, he thought there wasn't anything in the world like the Navy. Uh -huh. And uh, back then, you could be the uh, shipboard Navy, or you could be aviation Navy. Mm -hmm. They were two separate. Although, just like if you were in a squadron, you didn't stay on a ship all the time. You just Your squadron went aboard when the ship was ready to get underway or going on maneuvers or going from the West Coast to Hawaii, something like that. And this cousin of mine was in aviation, naval aviation. He was, at first he was, they call him ordnance man, and he would get all the bombers and the fighters and all of them ready when they were going to go into combat, arm all the machine guns and if we were going... <clears throat> attack a, a Jap ship, they'd carry bombs and all that sort of thing. And that's what he was, an ordnance man. On board a carrier? No. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was on the carrier. He started out on a carrier. Which which carrier? Well, I don't know which one he went aboard, but now then he put in for aviation flight school, and he got it, which was... Pretty unusual for an enlisted man to get flight school. Usually these were officers right out of the academy or out of college. And uh, so... Uh, well, at the time in the Pacific, you had the Yorktown, you had the Lexington, the Saratoga, the Enterprise. And those the were the carriers. Those were the carriers. So yeah. that doesn't ring a bell which oh, one yeah. of those he would have been. Well... The one that he was on when he was shot down and killed was the Enterprise. I always remember that because the little town he was from in Alabama was named Enterprise. And uh, so... Uh, so he became like a flying chief, is that what He was it? a flying chief, and then when the war came along, they commissioned all of them. Mm -hmm. And I think he was an ensign or a J.G. Mm -hmm. And so at Midway, what, what was his involvement there, Dad? Well, he was a torpedo pilot, torpedo plane pilot off the Enterprise. And I know I used to see him a lot in Hawaii. He was 
when the ship would come in, I'd usually go over to the carrier with him, or he'd come aboard the vessel where I was. And, uh, but, uh, <coughs> what was I going? You, you were talking about his name, and, uh, and that was Bobby Brock, is that correct? He was John Wiley Brock. He was the first cousin of mine. Of uh, flying torpedo planes off the Enterprise, off the Enterprise during the Battle of Midway. Right. And that's when he uh, lost his life. Yeah. Yeah, really, a lot of people considered the uh, a total loss futile his torpedo squadron because they were eight planes and they were launched from the Enterprise and to attack the Japanese carrier. And they'd been a mix up earlier because when the when the uh Jap when the uh American well bombers or torpedo plane, the early ones, launched all the fighter pilots to protect them, attacking the Jap carrier. But now on the Enterprise they uh, they attacked the Jap carrier and I think maybe sunk it, but they'd taken the plane back aboard ship, and then they had had uh, were sitting there, all fueled up and ready to go, and then uh, the Japanese carrier was coming in to attack them, so they launched uh, all their torpedo their torpedo planes against this carrier, and that was the one my cousin was on. One of those, he was pilot of one of those planes. And all eight of those planes were shot down as they were going in because the fighter plane cover that had been supposed to have been there to protect them, there was a foul up and they didn't show up. So they went in just completely helpless against that Japanese carrier. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, so getting getting back to your um, your own career, there, right. uh, going out to, to the motor torpedo uh, squadron in, in Tulagi, was this uh, volunteer, um, did, did you volunteer for this uh, duty or were you were you selected no, after you No, I was I would yeah, I I probably would have volunteered. It it wasn't looked on as especially hazardous or anything. But I was on a I was on a ship up around Guadalcanal. I was the first one on a tanker. And then they needed personnel over the motor torpedo boat base to keep the motor torpedo boats operating. Electricians as well? Well, all ratings. All ratings. So they set up a shop on Tulagi, and they had a, a, a dry dock, and they could pull the PT boats out of the water and repair the bottom when these ensigns would run them over a reef, which they did periodically. And so I was at that repair bay. Well, how did your duties there at that repair base differ from what you did aboard the vessel? Well, on the vessel, I just took care of ships to go alongside that needed work done. But there at the, on Tulagi at the motor torpedo boat base, the uh, motor torpedo boats would come into us and we'd pull them out of, we had dry docks, had about three dry docks made out of oil drums and we could pump them out and get the uh, get the motor torpedo boats out of the water so they could it could be repaired. Most of the repair was for they were reefs everywhere, and of course we didn't know the waters too well as well as the Japs did. The Japs could Japs would come in there at night and steam along at 20 knots just offshore and our ships were were afraid of the wind because we didn't know the water the way they did. They'd had pearl divers in there for years prior to the war, so they had charts of every foot of that of that area there. 
But now, Dave, while you were there, um, there was a uh, there, there was a there was a young man that killed one of his own soldiers that that was under your charge. Isn't that correct? What happened there? Oh yeah, that was a real sad thing. Uh, well, down in I was in New Mayo, New Caledonia, after a, after. Well, I guess I was I was sent to New Maya, New Caledonia. I guess to to wait to go up to the Solomons, and uh, so I I left New Maya, and I had forty sailors who were all going up for various assignments, and uh, I was the only chief, so they gave us all rifles and bayonets and put us on a transport, we went to Guadalcanal and we offloaded and went on to Henderson Field and then a whole bunch of us were sent over to to, to Tulagi, like I was, to set up this uh, motor torpedo boat base. And uh, <clears throat> well, and we just stayed over there repairing PT boats mainly rewired them where they ran over a reef and flooded the engine room and when they made the motor torpedo boat all the wiring in in the boat was had asbestos insulation. Well that was great if they had a fire. But all our problem was was running over a reef and getting the engine room flooded. So when it did, and that asbestos insulated wiring in the engine room got flooded, you it wouldn't dry dry out. It'd never dry out. So you had to replace every bit of that wiring. And uh, what happened though? You you uh, you said you had these. Uh all these soldiers that were under your charge and you guys were Oh, the guy that was killed. Yeah, well, they sent us up to Guadalcanal and they sent us all ashore and there was an old thatch building there that the natives had used as a meeting place. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. It was a meeting place, so we we were all issued cots. So uh, I took the guy and took them all in that building. I had a 40 and uh, got them bedded down. And the uh, commanding officer down there called me in, and he said, now they're still some Japs over on Florida Island, which is the island, the big island next to Tulagi. 